So, as you've heard, I was recognized by the Obama White House for my work to uh, integrate social equity into the Climate Action Plan for the city of Portland. But what if I told you that the secret to addressing climate change can be found in this symbol? It's probably not what you were expecting me to start off with, right? So what is this symbol? This symbol is an Adinkra symbol. It comes from the Akan people of Ghana, West Africa. And Adinkra symbols are like metaphors of traditional indigenous wisdom. This one is called Sankofa. Sankofa means, well, San means to return, Ko means to go, and Fa means to fetch. And the image is of a bird reaching back to actually fetch an egg. So we understand this to mean that in order to move forward, we must learn from the lessons of the past. Say it with me, Sankofa. Sankofa. Wonderful. So Sankofa has been a concept that has inspired my work forever. And today I wanted to share a story with you about how it had gained even deeper meaning in my life. So I wanna start off with this question. Where are you from? This is all about our history. And it's a simple enough question. We ask it all the time. But for me, it's actually been a super complicated question. Growing up as a kid, we moved around a lot for my dad's career. And so there was no city that I ever really felt like was home. We could never really develop enough roots. And I'm Filipino and black. And despite me being very proud of my racial and ethnic her heritage in the United States, there isn't necessarily a place that I feel particularly connected to. So when people would ask me this question, I would say, well, I'm not really from anywhere, or I would say, nowhere. Fast forward to 2014. I had the opportunity to participate in a leadership cohort and visit the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, which is near Pendleton, Oregon. One of the members of the leadership cohort uh, lived there and was a member of one of the tribes and was a cultural educator. She took us on a tour of the reservation lands on the second day, and we had the opportunity to learn about the history of the land. She shared with us stories of her people. Some of them were tragic histories. There were other stories of how they had reclaimed many of acres of land from the US government. She talked about their traditions and their stories of food and how they came together in these places. We stopped to maybe a dozen different places. And after a while, I noticed that after she would tell us a story, she would disappear. <laughs> I was like, where is she going? <laughs> But nobody else seemed to be paying attention to this, but she would disappear and then she would come back and she'd have these plants. And she would throw them into the back of her car and by the end of the day, it was completely filled. And I think we even had like a huge bush back there, but there were branches and roots and dried flowers and just things of all kinds of sorts. And I realized as we were looking at these vistas and views, admiring their beauty, maybe even doing a little bit of self-reflection, she was seeing this mountainside as a medicine cabinet, maybe even a buffet. And I looked at it, looking for what she saw, and all I saw was grass. So the next day, we had the opportunity to debrief this tour. And something weird happened. I was sitting there and everybody's doing their individual check-in, how they're feeling. Many were very deeply moved, and I just started to cry. I started to weep. And I cried so hard and so long, I became physically ill and sick, and I had to leave the group. And I was back in my hotel room trying to get myself together and realized I had to actually go back to Portland that night, which was a four and a half hour drive. So I had to leave everyone. I couldn't really fully process what was going on. But in truth, it probably was the best thing that could have happened to me because those four and a half hours by myself in a car going home, I had an opportunity to reflect and figure out what the heck was going on with me. And what I realized was that I was experiencing a process of grief. That I realized that I felt like an orphan and I was mourning the loss of something that 
I realized I would never know. It was the loss of a relationship with land, an intergenerational relationship. To know every square inch of a place and call it home to belong, that I would never know that. It's not just about the names of plants and animals. It's to know their scents, to know their patterns, to know how the land breathes, to know their stories as if they are relatives. And it was a deep, deep heartache. So, on my way home, I was like, I gotta do something about this. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a DNA test. <laughs> and I think secretly I was like, somebody adopt me. I mean, I love my parents. I'm not saying I want new parents, but I was like, culturally, somebody adopt me. So I did this DNA test, and I was so excited. I remember waiting for the results to come in. And the results came in, and I found out that I'm literally from everywhere. <laughs> which is equally as unhelpful as being from nowhere. <laughs> so, what is a girl gonna do? <sighs> you know, who we are is very much a result of our relationship with land. <sighs> it shapes who we know, who we're connected to. It cultivates our worldview, our, our belief systems, what we believe is real and what is right. So if I'm from nowhere, and if I'm from everywhere, what could that possibly mean for me? When I look at this map, I see a story of human migration. Some of it was voluntary. But in large part, this is a story of slavery and colonization. And my ancestral relationship to nature and land is one that's been very traumatic and conflicting, leaving me with this disconnected feeling. And I don't believe I'm unique in this, actually. I think many of us have felt this dis disconnected um, sense of culture and land. And I realized that this work that I was doing around equity, sustainability, and climate change was in very much, in very many ways, a healing work to address this disconnection by building relationship with one another, by real, building relationship with place. And by doing this, it was a healing process for me as well. So how did I go about doing this? In many ways, I did this because I was working in government. It was to see how the organizational culture of government had been shaped by our past, and that, that helped to create our troubled present. It was about being able to offer alternative ways of living through and working through organizational culture that could offer a different path forward. So how do you start that in government? Well, you start that with a story of, of that past. And I could start in the 1400s, but I didn't. I started uh, a little bit earlier. I started in where um, our nation's founders, our motivations of our nation's founders in creating our initial institutions of law and democracy. Government, despite every man being created equal, does not treat every man equally, or woman, or transgender person. This has a history. Our government legitimized a system of race based off of skin color to justify dehumanization. Slavery drove a global production system based off of exploitation of people and of natural resources. And for millennia before this, in our history, we were part of the ecosystem of our natural environment. But these two disassociative relationships have now produced the most consumptive, exploitative economies this world has ever seen. It is this human nature power relationship, or psychosis. That is what has produced climate change. 
It's something that we have inherited. We were not there when it began, but it is a legacy that we live within. We are all intrinsically tied to it, and we have a responsibility to change it. But how? As part of this healing process, I had been doing research um, around indigenous belief systems in the Philippines. Came across this concept of kapwa. Kapwa is about our shared humanity. And for me, it described how I try to be and how I try to work with people. What it describes is that we are all relatives. You and I are related. We are intertwined in this ecosystem of humanity. And when we see ourselves as extensions of one another, we can't help but act in accountable and compassionate ways. In many ways, what I'm talking about is unconditional love. And it's that unconditional love that's required to create beloved community. Beloved community is something that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about often. And this is my favorite quote of his. That darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. It's a reminder in what feels like a very dark time in our nation and world of the type of action that we must take to move forward. So there is another version of the symbol Sankofa. This one is shaped like a heart. And I've often said that the work of racial justice, social equity, the reason why this is hard work, the reason it's so difficult is because we actually don't have any lived memory of when that existed. This is true of climate change too, which is why we need a creative solutions, why we need to use our imaginations, right? I still believe this to be true. But as I've gone on this path of finding where I'm from, I realize that we have another memory, another source of memory, and it's here in our hearts. When we can tap into that memory, what we see and what we remember is that we are brothers and sisters, that you are aunties and uncles, that you are mothers and fathers, cousins, that we are family, that we must protect one another, that we must fight for one another. And that's when our humanity is activated. So I did this work on the climate action plan in the city of Portland, and it's work I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of. And it had an impact more than I ever thought it would, because we were doing something small and trying to create change in a city where people of color did not feel included. And it did that. It changed things, and it was necessary work. But what I learned in this process is that technical and scientific and policy solutions are not going to be enough. Because this fix, it's a human one. So if we can tap into these deep, deep ancestral memories. If we can go back and fetch them, deeply listen to them, I believe that is what can help us create the vision for what we need to create in the future. So this question, where am I from? What did I figure out? I figured out I'm from nowhere, and I figured out I'm from everywhere. But what does that mean? This journey helped me to see that where I'm from is actually an intersection. And that intersection is actually a beautiful place because it's a place where all of these cultures come together, where all of these experiences come together, all of these relationships come together. 
The other reason why an intersection is a fantastic place to be is because I have a choice in which direction I can go. And so I have chosen a path, and that path is one to stay connected, connected to my past, connected to the land, connected to people. And it's that path that I invite you to join me on. Thank you.